because it's time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Welcome at the University of Rome La Sapienza, the Department of uh, European, American, and Intercultural Studies, where we have uh, one of the ma many steps of our uh, globality going on with our meetings. Um, I say I and welcome to you, but in fact I say to all the world, if you allow me, because uh, we are obliged to start now, because we have already more than uh, about 15 groups uh, already in contact with us following our streaming live, and so because they are in contact with us from various continents, uh, we cannot uh, consider that uh, the center of the world is Rome and then we can wait for a few minutes. The, the director of the department is a little late because she's in a traffic jam, as always in Rome in the morning, and she will come here. But we have already Professor Grusa, um, uh, who is uh, chairman of this uh, Italian-funded uh, research on migration and cultural interaction, inter inter integration and territorial setting in Italy. So yeah, I ask uh, Professor um, Brusa to join the greetings and the welcoming to this meeting. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I have the pleasure to bring to all of you the greeting of the Association of Italian Geographers and uh, especially those of the members of the Commission named Foreign Immigration in Italy. I am currently the coordinator of this commission and also the national coordinator of a project founded by the Ministry, ministry of the University entitled Migration and Processes of Cultural Interaction, Patterns of Integration and Spatial Organization in Italian Local Case Study Areas. Several scholars uh, working in several Italian universities both established experts, as Armando, in the field, and uh, young researchers are members of these two study groups, which partially overlap. Researches related to the growing importance of geographical mobility in the era of global change are currently carried on by these units. I can also add that uh, in Italy these research uh, topics uh, have been studied for a long time, especially with reference to migration flows. Starting from the first Italian National Congress, geographers have actively engaged these researches. The Geographical Cong uh, uh, Congress, a cornerstone of the development of our beloved uh, discipline in the country was held in Genoa in 1892 as part of the celebration of the fourth anniversary of Christopher Columbus' departure to his journey to America. It was a time when huge migratory flows took place with Italians leaving their homeland often uh, from the very harbor of Genoa towards their challenging discovery of America, not a successful, a successful one for everybody. Following the changes in the economy, in the society, and also in the political arena in our country, geographers have been studying within a continuous development of the discipline, both the migratory flows of Italian citizens toward foreign countries and the internal mobility in the national territory and later on also the international migration for which Italy is the destination country. One can mention three authoritative scholars in these research uh, fields, Elio Migliorini, Giorgio Valussi and Costantino Caldo. They all studies migratory flows in three differential, different historical times. One can mention the key note address titled 
internal migration and the territorial movement of Italian population given by Migliorini at the 18th Geographical Congress in 1961. That year marked the 100th anniversary on the Italian unification. This occasion happened to be celebrated in a period of economic boom that is dramatically different from our current time of crisis. This year, uh, 211 marks the 115th anniversary of the country. On the other hand, one can mention Giorgio Valussi efforts in organizing the National Conference Italian in Movement in 1978, following his call for papers, scholar, most of all concentrated their study on the then growing phenomena of return migration to Italy. Thanks to the improved economic uh, condition in the country, in fact, many migrants who had been forced to leave their native land in the years following the Second World War, returned home in the 60s and in the 70s. Last, Costantino Caldo was the first geographer to write about foreign immigration to Italy in a paper entitled Rural Exodus and Immigration from the North Africa in Western Sicily and presented at the 22nd Italian Geographical Congress in 1975. I will stop here after thanking, thanking all of you for coming to Italy and in particular Professor Armando Montanari, who as the chair of International Geographical Union Commission Globality, uh, encourages all of us to carry on researches in this interesting field of studies. This conference is the last tessera of a rich mosaic that has been made with intelligent, generous, and critical engagement by Armando and Bardana. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Carlo Brusa. I just joined the opening of uh, this uh, uh, conference uh, by saying a few words concerning uh, global change and human mobility. I welcome also Mrs. Uh, Francesca Bernardini. She is the director. She just came out of, of the traffic jam. You can sit and you can say the words you prepare. Before this, uh, I would like also to say hello to Ron Abler, who is not uh, with us physically, but I received a message that he's in contact with us. At the moment, he's uh, in Venice, and so he's in his uh, hotel room following us by streaming. Don't smile, <laughs> Yoshi. This is the reality. I have the message. <laughs> so when you will make your presentation, you will have also the president of all the International Geographical Union, and so pay attention what you are going to say. <laughs> uh, Francesca, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, no, 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 uh, but uh, anyway, I feel very pleased and honored opening this very important meeting, uh, which gets together in our university so many authorities and experts from many countries, and among them some young scholars. Uh, you'll have the opportunity of reporting the results of your researches and of discussing about subjects which uh, are topical and notable for the international community, even when they look of national or local interest. I mean migration, community, uh, integration, employment, uh, university students' international mobility, university policies, and also the environmental and social impact of natural disasters. This meeting is an important part of the International Geographical Union's activities and uh, releases 
the scientific results of the national project theme on migration and cultural interaction, integration, and territorial setting in Italy, whose chairman is Professor Carlo Brusa, and of the European Research Program SECOA, whose chairman is Professor Armando Montanari. Armando Montanari is also the chairman of this Globality Commission meeting. Um, and uh, let me say that uh, Armando is uh, the activist and more enterprising scholar in my department uh, in the field of European uh, research. And uh, let me say also that he gives us a lot of prestige, of money, and of course also of work. Uh, on behalf of my department, uh, I thank the meeting managers, all the speakers, the public, the friends of DigiLab, who are cooperating in spreading the meeting's works by internet all over the world. I wish the best success for you all and a nice day in Rome. Thank you. Um, thank you, Francesca. Uh, before starting, several friends asked me, what about uh, the new um, reformation of the university in Italy, which is the new role of the department? Okay, we will discuss during the coffee break and during the lunch time. It is a long story, but in any case, at the moment, uh, the, the department uh, at the uh, Sapienza University has a pivotal uh, role because uh, the faculty are losing their importance and the departments are gaining more importance since they are coordinating both the teaching and the research activity at the university. So I thank very much uh, Francesca because she is coming, she is the major authority in our world and uh, for your kind words and especially stressing the fact that it's important to make research. This is uh, my message to, to Rome and to the world that uh, uh, our major function, I mean people of the university is research. Mm -hmm. And uh, this globality, I now are going to spend few words about the first 10 years of globality story is based on voluntary work. I mean, uh, they are receiving money if they receive at home, but there is not uh, money which is distributed at the international level. So in spite of the difficulties that uh, economic crisis is interesting uh, many countries, not mm -hmm. only Italy and not only the Italian universities, uh, uh, we are achieving several uh, results. I'm going to give uh, only some ideas of what we achieved during the last 10 years. Thank you. Okay. So I uh, continue with our, with our opening and I uh, just uh, mentioned few elements in concerning um, human, I mean, the globality. The globality is existing because the chairman, myself, of course, uh, but mainly because uh, uh, our colleague, uh, uh, Professor Ishitaka Yoshi from uh, Kyoto, who has been effectively managing all this activity, also having a fantastic website, uh, the one where you can find the logo that you, we use also in this occasion. So it was a, a, a very important work done uh, initially by two people, uh, Yoshi and myself, and then many other friends going around. We have uh, more than uh, then uh, I mean teams are working in more than 100, uh, around 100 countries. Uh, so really this is a very important network. Due to economic crisis, as I mentioned before, not always is possible to have everybody following us. But in any case, uh, the contacts are going on very well, thanks also to Yoshi. Uh, well, this was uh, where we started. We started from a modern world society and then uh, from the push-pull theory. This is, was... Uh, the end of the 90s. Uh, today, uh, we move afterwards in our studies to a kind of uh, contemporary world society, what we mentioned, in a network structure so that uh, we um, also consider the production mobility, production-led mobility, a consumption-led mobility because uh, geographers are traditionally based on this uh, geography of population. And so many people also within the International Geographic Union well, little um, not sure about the necessity of, uh, in a certain way, um, not more considering geography of, of population, no more considering geography of tourists, which are still very popular in our 
faculties, our university, in our research activity, and then introducing a new concept. So it was not so easy. It is not uh, easy just to say migration doesn't exist anymore as the subject of study, and tourists cannot stay anymore alone in this way. Well, uh, why we started to consider global change? But global change uh, in the 90s was absolutely an important element, and because uh, we have advantage of scale, we see during these days all the economic crises are clearly indicating that there are several layers, uh, several levels, and one of them is global change, and then uh, we also consider this level as a, a, a process where the regulation, liberalization, geopolitical changes together have resulted in accelerated movement to goods of people, capital, message, culture, communication, and so on, and vice versa. Um, where is coming from uh, this uh, globality? Globality is uh, starting from another project, research project. We are research people. We are not journalists. We are not uh, people spending our time in coffee houses. We are making research. So there was a group of us uh, started during the 90s in this project, Regional and Urban Structure in Europe, uh, financed by the European uh, Science Foundation. Uh, the idea of globality was discussed during the IGU Congress uh, in 96. Uh, and then finally, we prepare a proposal between 96 and the year 2000. And finally, this proposal was uh, accepted uh, at the IGU Congress in Seoul, Korea, where we had the first meeting. The first meeting, probably at that time, we were only Yoshi, myself, and a few others. Uh, they were wondering. Uh, and waiting our collapse uh, because uh, many of our colleagues, they were sure we couldn't go on uh, absolutely with this strange, very idea. Well, we went on because uh, we started in the year 2000 um, with a meeting in Korea in 2001 in Italy, then in the States, then in South Africa. Then we went in Mongolia because we considered this is uh, the land of uh, human mobility. So we had, and so I was uh, living in a Mongolian camp for a few days. And then uh, Palma de Mallorca in Spain in 2004 in Glasgow, five again in Italy, then Brisbane, in Australia, then Hong Kong in China, Tunisia, Spain, Slovakia, Israel, then today in Italy, and then in a few weeks in Chile, in Santiago. Well, uh, the core of the project has been present on, on in every of this meeting. I'm not going to list all the publications that we produce. Uh, only wanted to give you an idea that uh, more or less, uh, although I repeat, I stress, um, we had not specific uh, financing, uh, we were able to go on. Also this meeting, as you notice, uh, there is not a fee, uh, which is very strange because in a time of uh, economic crisis, uh, the major international organizations are going to organize world uh, meeting, international meeting with fees, which are quite expensive. We are very simple. We are not offering luxurious uh, coffee break. N no co we are only offering the break. Uh, you put the coffee in the next square. Uh, we meet here in San Lorenzo, is uh, once a popular area, in any case today, is a gentrified uh, district of Rome where you can find a lot of uh, small restaurants, uh, coffee houses, and so on. But uh, as you know, as you see, we never requested fees in our meetings. And then uh, everybody knows it because we were all together there and uh, this was our policy. And uh, especially now that it's so difficult and too expensive for our limited resources to travel, uh, this is very important. This has been very important. I hope that also in the future we'll continue in this way. Well, uh, mobility is a, a, a fundamental geographical aspect of existence. I mean, how can we, I consider geography without mobility? It's alternative to place, uh, with this without boundness, foundation, stability, and so on. But how to capture, capture mobility? In fact, this is our major problem. We have uh, the concept, uh, but uh, data are not always available. Um, in the Sequoia project, uh, we put as uh, one of the major elements uh, focused on the mobility issues. Data are not existing for this very simple reason that we are anticipating the culture. We are innovative uh, people, and so statistical offices are not uh, 
publishing uh, in a very clear way data that uh, can be used for this purpose. So it's uh, inevitable. So we were wanting through filming, for instance, mobility as a representation. Tarantino, for instance, this is my favorite for illustrate mobility in the filming. Mobility as a direct experience, the representation meaning of mobility. Then there is uh, the mobility of a time. Uh, mobility existed always. Tom tomorrow we'll make a field trip in Ostia Antica, among the other uh, areas we'll visit, and we'll show you the mobility at the time of the Roman Empire. Of course, uh, you, you cannot find it uh, on the guides, on the tourist guides, but we will show you some places where it's clearly identified that the word of that uh, of that period, I mean the Mediterranean, was present. They used to come to Rome, and especially in Ostia Antica, still elements that uh, can be found. Um, of course, uh, in the feudal society, mobility had uh, a, a meaning. In the mercantile society, different than the European national states, then today there is uh, the right to move within. But uh, this right is extremely limited since yesterday. The Council, uh, the European Union voted again uh, opening the frontier to some of the countries and uh, two, two, two members uh, voted again uh, because uh, they don't want to open the Schengen, I mean the right to move within for various reasons. This is something that uh, is difficult to achieve. Then there is the concept of nomadism, which is very old uh, and uh, uh, since among us uh, today we spoke with uh, an economist who is going to contribute, we never closed the door to other social sciences, and we mainly made reference uh, to people like Ari, who is a sociologist, or Atali, political scientist, uh, where the nomadism is considered a kind of hip hop bell. Uh, well, I spoke about uh, Mongolian tents. Uh, this is where I, I've been, uh, just to, to organize this conference in Ulaanbaatar a few years ago. Well, uh, I mentioned this uh, not because uh, Mongolia, but because France. Uh, France uh, today, uh, you know well, <laughs> is proposing a similar form of nomadism using the Mongolian tents. So you can do, go to Cheyenne. I, I took this uh, from the web. Uh, you can buy. And then uh, already villages. Uh, and I hope that uh, the geographers, especially the French geographers, and we have some colleagues here, from uh, Paris, uh, they can start in studying how this, uh, um, this, uh, these tents are going to be placed on the territory. Uh, now they are fashionable, it's a fashionable movement because it's considered, vertical commas, um, sustainable movement. I don't know if it's true, but in any case, uh, I have been surprised that uh, today, uh, this year, they started this uh, strong movement of uh, Mongolian tents and Mongolian nomadism uh, within Europe. Um, there is a lens of mobility, of course, uh, because this is what uh, we try to introduce. Uh, we want to open the concept of uh, how to read. N we need the lens. Uh, Harry mentioned this. Uh, and of course, uh, Harry is a sociologist, and using the lens of sociology, we should use the lens of uh, geography, of the territory, of places. Um, is possible to consider tourism per se? No, absolutely. Uh, of course, uh, tourism is considered in a certain way, very positive, migration sometimes very negative, but uh, they are extremely cotated. Um, of course, uh, tourism is also concerned with the relationship, mobilization of memories, performance, gender, specialized body, emotions, atmosphere, exactly like um, migration. Um, uh, a special chapter we opened uh, since last year. It was last year in Israel, in Haifa, where we organized a meeting, where we consider, okay, the economic crisis is surely affecting mobility, mobility of goods, of people, financial mobility, and so on. In fact, uh, we notice more and more intensive these elements. Well, uh, I think that uh, we can say uh, just a kind of summary. Uh, we consider the modern society and so the push-pull theory. We consider the postmodern society, the network mobility. And then uh, we are considering, we started to consider already, Zyga, this is a work for you, this kind of hybrid mobility. 
I mean the liquid society, which is form of different layers moving in a different way, in a different speed, and then uh, that where there is uh, an information communication society, like today, we are part of this society. No supply, no demand mobility, information-based mobility, all the our methods of study, all geography, sociology, social sciences are going to be restructured because uh, we are no more in a modern society. And we have to leave uh, the study of uh, migration of tourists to the historians, not necessarily historians be per se. W they want to make history of geography, they, they open, their door are open for them. Um, I concluded my, my presentation of globality very short, and then with your permission, I would like to start uh, uh, the first session, also because we recovered more or less time, and then uh, we continue with the first people. The conference, uh, you have received uh, the program, otherwise it's there. In any case, I repeat, I invite uh, uh, Luca de Ravignone and uh, Marco Ramazzotti to come here to join myself on the table to speak about taxonomy, modeling, neural networks applied to human mobility an experience uh, within the Sequoia FP7 frame, I saw three here, uh, in order to, in order to moderate, you need a replacement. Um, uh, I inform uh, all the speakers, starting from the first speakers, that uh, they have uh, about 20 minutes uh, to intervene, and then uh, we are planning uh, to use 10 minutes for the discussion. I, um, I organize two flags, one green for five minutes in advance, and one red. After the red, uh, you are just expelled outside the room because uh, we have people following us and then uh, there are people that would like to follow only one uh, paper more than another and then uh, we have to keep the time. So, are you ready? Yes. Yes, thank Please. you, dear colleague, dear chair. Thank you for this, um, your invitation here. Um, we are going to present some of our preliminary results about an experimental analysis using artificial neural nets the artificial adapted systems um, form part of the vast world uh, of natural computation. Natural computation is a subset of the artificial sciences. The diagram shows how the analysis of natural and, and or cultural processes that need to be understood starts from a theory which adequately formalized formal algebra is able to generate automatic artificial models of those natural and cultural processes. Lastly, uh, the generated automatic artificial models must be compared with natural and cultural processes of which they profess to be the model and the explanation. Artificial societies means those sciences for which an understanding of natural and or cultural processes is achieved by the recreation of those processes through automatic models. In particular, natural computation tries to construct automatic models of complex processes using the local interaction of elementary microprocesses, stimulating the original process functioning. Such models organize themselves in space and time and connect in a non-linear way to the global process they are part of, trying to reproduce the complexity through the dynamic creation of specific and independent local rules that transform themselves in relation to dynamics of the processes. The diagram uh, shows in more detail the formalization 
automation and comparison between natural and or cultural processes and automatic artificial models seen from two points of view, classical computation and natural computation. Each point of view can be seen as a cycle that can repeat itself several times. This allows to reduce that the human scientific process characterizing both the cycles resembles more the natural computation than the classical computation one. Natural computation constitutes the alternative classical computation. This one, in fact, has great difficulty in facing natural cultural processes, especially when it tries to impose external rules to understand and reproduce them, trying to formalize these processes in an artificial model. In natural computation and it, artificial adaptive systems our theories with generative algebras are able to create artificial models simulating natural phenomena. The taxonomic trees here of the disciplines that make up the artificial science system. The learning and growing process of the models is isomorphic to the natural process evolution that is, it's itself an artificial model comparable with the origin of the natural process. Artificial neural network are the more diffused and mass known learning systems models in natural computation. The diagram shows two main types of artificial neural nets. The artificial neural net that that from parameters, rules, and constraints gives the optimal data, and the NNN that from data elaborates optimal rules. Artificial neural nets may in general be used to resolve three types of complex problems, and consequently, they can be classified in three subfamilies. Supervised artificial neural nets. The first type of problem that an artificial neural net can be deal with can be expressed as follow. Given n variables about which it's easy to get your data, and m variables which differ from the first and about which it's difficult and costly to get your data, assess whether it is possible to predict the values of the n variables and on the basis of on n variables. Dynamic associative memory, the second type of the problem, the second type of problem that uh, an artificial neural network can be expressed as follow. Given n variable defining a data set, find out its optimal connection matrix able to define each variable in terms of the other and consequently to approximate the hypersurface on which each data point is located. How the poetic artificial neural nets, the third type of artificial neural net can be described as follow, given n variable, define m records in a data set how these variables are distributed and how these records are naturally clustered in a small projection space, K, according to the most important relationship. The self-organizing map, SOM, is one of the most important architectures of the neural network. It was developed mainly by co -Onan between 79 and 82, in part on the basis of previously studies by Marsborg and will show. In the sum is defined a, a um, characteristic element, a layer called layer of coonin, constituted by processing elements, disposed specially in ordered way. 
we can have one-dimensional, bi-dimensional, three-dimensional layers of coherence, and also with more than three dimensions. The typical dimensionality of the layer of coherence is of two dimensions. This layer of processing elements evolves during the learning specializing the position of the single processing elements as indicator of the statistical characteristic important for the input stimulus. This process of special organization of the characteristic of input data is called feature mapping. The sum realize the feature mapping with a technique of non-supervised learning from which name that indicates the self-organization. Thus, the sum is also known in literature Conan feature map. And now, I'm just introduced the experimental application of the self-organizing maps made by Sequa Researchers Group and presented by my colleague, Luca Deravino. This presentation is going to show you some uh, of the very first uh, results of uh, some of our um, uh, researches. And uh, there are several uh, projects involved, and one is the SEQA project that uh, uh, Marco Ramazzotti told you. So one of the aims uh, of these projects uh, is uh, just the study of uh, human mobility. And uh, in particular, in this case, I will show you some results about uh, Europe, USA, and uh, with the uh, internal and uh, migration in between uh, the one each other. The aims are more um, in the are in particular the differences and parallelism between different world countries on the basis of very few available information. And then uh, to study the, compl the complex interconnection between uh, uh, human mobility and the economic and social variables as uh, introduced by Professor Montanari. So this is the, uh, an example of a database that uh, we have uh, tried to explore. So we can see the USA space with uh, population variables in uh, stock. So uh, just the resident people and foreign citizens uh, variables. Then the ESPON space uh, with the net migration variables, immigration flows, and uh, other variables. And then the international immigration between uh, ESPON space and uh, USA. The tank coverage is uh, various in the from uh, 2000 and 2008, approximately. So. The, there is a matrix that we have used of uh, data is uh, composed by 226 uh, world countries. And uh, in this case, the data refer to the uh, 2000, 2007. Uh, as introduced before, uh, we have used uh, some uh, artificial neural network. Uh, and um, uh, basically, it's a process of uh, data mining, so uh, just uh, sort of a clustering of uh, these uh, different countries uh, using these variables that in our case we are just two variables so the number of uh, outgoing uh, uh, migrants and the incoming uh, persons so the, um, the I will show you the data matrix so it's just uh, the records are the uh, one the 2000 uh, 226 uh, countries from this D means the destination. And uh, in this case, the, uh, in the uh, Y axis, uh, you can see the same countries, but uh, as a result of the, uh, the, the place where they have started. So obviously, the, uh, this line is zero because uh, it's uh, just international. And for studying this, uh, all these big data set, we have used a self-organizing map uh, the of uh, three by six uh, units. So as you have shown, uh, as shown before, there was a uh, very big uh, neural networks. In this case, is a, a small one. Maybe we we may use a bigger 
uh, left just for uh, being sure to do, um, reflect the complexity of the data. But in this case, we have to prefer to use a small one just because uh, it's uh, more intuitive to uh, gain some information from uh, that uh, data as you can uh, see now. So this is the first result of uh, the neural networks. So these are the units, three by six, and uh, 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 each one of these uh, dots represents the number of uh, countries that are in that cluster. So this is the biggest cluster in uh, all the nets, and then we can, in a, in a certain way, we can um, say that uh, these and these are more related the one each other. In fact, we have tried to put a color that is, the more that you go away, the more is different. So you use orange, red, etc., and uh, the far ones are more blue, green, etc. So this is the representation on the map. So every country is uh, colored uh, in relationship uh, to the, this diagram. So uh, the interesting uh, thing is uh, you can notice that, uh, for example, many countries of the uh, Southern America and uh, Africa and etc. are very uh, related. I'm sorry, the, the colors are a bit different, so there are also some variations in between. And, uh, and this is very interesting in my opinion because uh, the, uh, in you, can, you have to consider that there are only two variables, so it's a very, uh, a very preliminary stage, of course, but uh, it's uh, very interesting to see. Another um, uh, test data is uh, the, just, mm, the same uh, matrix, but uh, reversed, so uh, using uh, um, countries as migration origin instead of uh, destination. So we have uh, done uh, another sum. In this case, uh, we represent uh, the data instead of the map with a hierarchical uh, dendrogram. So these are represents uh, all the countries, and you can see these are more uh, aggregated. They are not uh, ending uh, one at the end of uh, all the all the branches, but uh, here there are all the 226 uh, countries. This is the, the resulting map. In this case, uh, the color does not represent the similarities between one place and another, but only the clusters. So if this uh, one is the states and uh, this and the Africa in a certain way. That's all if there are questions or suggestions. <laughs> Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Also, the time. I haven't used the flex because uh, you were perfectly in. Um, questions? Yes. Can you say your name, where you're coming from? Just for the others. <laughs> a moment, a moment. Uh, you need the microphone. And then, uh, Thank you. Thank you, Armando. My name is Yann Richard. I come from uh, the University of Paris, uh, Panthéon-Sorbonne. I've been very much interested by your map uh, based on the uh, clustering uh, method, yes. And, uh, but but uh, because of the speaking time, it, w it went uh, really fast. And could yes. you please take one minute more to, 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 yes. to comment, especially the colors? Uh, why uh, some geographical ensemble are green and why some of them are blue yes. and so on. I ask you this question because I will show you also a cl this kind of map based only on the mobility of international students and they were really interesting. Thank you so much. Mm. So if that way I have run the <laughs> a lot. If you can in, in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Thank you. So this map, uh, uh, the, the colors are just random. But the only uh, fact that we have uh, done is that, uh, like starting from the big one, so from this dot, we have tried to represent the similarities between the different uh, clusters in terms of uh, similarity of colors. So this, if this one is orange, the, these four are the more similar to this. So we have tried to put colors that uh, represent in a 
in a certain way the similarity with the, the central color. Then the more you go away, the more the color is different. So we have uh, created a pattern in uh, RGB colors. So uh, we have uh, subtracted uh, uh, each uh, from each color a uh, certain quantity of uh, R and G and B. So it's not uh, really random. Uh, it's uh, studied uh, on uh, an Excel uh, spreadsheet. So uh, like this one, yeah, in special, uh, especially, is the more distant uh, from uh, here. In fact, the color is just uh, ri ri quite the opposite. And also these uh, are more uh, distant, so we have tried to represent it uh, in a sort of a very different way. So that when you see the map, you can see approximately the similarities between uh, countries and cards. So for example, you can see that uh, if this part is orange, these uh, are quite similar, so not very distant. Obviously, you have to consider that these are only two variables, so I'm surprised of this result because uh, uh, the more variables are involved, obviously, and the more the sum is uh, powerful. So you can uh, create clusters from uh, um, very uh, big um, from uh, a lot of parameters and uh, without knowing the real relationship uh, between the one parameter or one variable and the other one. So maybe this is uh, the sort of uh, very famous problem of the neural net that is the black box. So you can see what you put in and what uh, came out but not uh, we is uh, inside. There are several uh, tests uh, that uh, you can do for looking uh, which variable is, is more important in that process of clustering or not. But this is just a starting uh, test, so we have not, not yet uh, done it. Thank you. Uh, you. Welts, welts, welts. Okay, I think that I can say the first problem is that uh, you have seen this is part of SECOA project. It means a solution for environmental contrast in coastal area. Uh, this is an FP7 project. If you put on uh, uh, any engine uh, SECOA project and then uh, or better be project SECOA, you will find uh, a website with more information. In any case, the project is based on uh, on human mobility, of course. I mean, the human mobility in relationship with these uh, global changes uh, and the effects uh, on uh, urban settlement in coastal area. Um, since I don't see any other question, I put a question to Marco. Um, you mentioned, uh, I'll give you the mic microphone, don't worry. Um, um, you mentioned some authors, some authors, so some names that were in your presentation. Um, what about uh, how old is this uh, activity, uh, which has been uh, the development of uh, literature during the recent times? Uh, um, how, how much is known, how much uh, is developing in the recent times? Uh, actually, it's, uh, uh, it's quite difficult to, to, to make an estimation about it because we have to distinguish the different uh, uh, levels of research is uh, if we are looking to the cognitive research uh, and to the, um, uh, I mean, philosophical and uh, epistemological tentative of uh, um, brain reconstruction, uh, we, we have a very huge literature. While uh, the, the, the formal algebra uh, reduction of uh, cognitive thought uh, start from uh, the 70s, I mean, uh, and uh, with this kind of uh, very different models. So it's... Uh <laughs> this is an ongoing uh, work. Of course, uh, today, uh, those disciplines that are in uh, front uh, are those that are receiving more money, because this is quite expensive. So you have medicine, biology, engineering, Con, con connected, considering sometimes insurance. In the near future, I expect also that uh, this uh, financial market advisor that I haven't found very well a model, they, they cannot go any more further with a traditional model. Um, well, 
Luca, you have been showing us a model which is based uh, on uh, a, a limited number of variables, a relatively limited number. What happens if uh, uh, the number of variables is growing? Uh, uh, the situation is more complicated. Is the system able, for what you know, to, to manage a, a, a yes, larger yes. number of variables? <laughs> yes, yes, of course. As I um, was told in, uh, in before, the, um, the number of variables uh, in when you use a neural network is uh, better uh, to have uh, a big, uh, huge uh, number of variables instead of uh, having a few variables. This is because uh, the, the neural nets are able to uh, find the patterns, uh, hidden patterns or relationships between uh, not just the single variables, uh, one uh, after the, the other one, but uh, the, uh, the way the, the, those variables interact uh, one with uh, each other. So in the black box, uh, you, um, you have to see how these variables are connecting one each other. So which one is more powerful uh, in terms of uh, aggregating uh, power and uh, or otherwise uh, there is one variable that for example is not uh, useful just in a minimal part. So um, I'm curious to <laughs> test <laughs> this uh, uh, data with uh, more variables as I wish that uh, in the <laughs> very in fact, uh, for future. Us, uh, this has been uh, a test, uh, a test uh, to start in working and now we would like to uh, apply this method to the core of, uh, of SECOA where the data are not only uh, socio-economic data but uh, socio-economic plus, uh, plus environmental data which makes things uh, much more complicated. Uh, we were not able to show you results on this because we are still fighting with data. Um, but uh, we wanted to confront ourselves uh, with some of your experience or your interest. Okay, at 10 o'clock, uh, we will start uh, with, a new, with a new presentation, which is by Martin Rosenfeld. I invite Martin to come here. And uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Martin is uh, from uh, uh, ULB. And then uh, uh, his presentation is uh, Brussels Cotonou, study of the migratory circulation taking place in the second-hand cars uh, exportation business between Brussels and West Africa. Martin, the floor is yours if you wish. Thank you very if much, you're ready. Professor. I was just waiting for the technique. So good morning, everybody. As Professor Montanari just said, I'm a PhD student in Brussels at the Université Libre de Bruxelles, and also in Paris at l'École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales. And I will speak today about um, this um, PhD research project. But just a few words of introduction. So um, today we are facing new debates in social science. And regarding the topic of human mobility, uh, globalization process introduced very broad uh, changes. Just two simple examples, we are more and more speaking of migratory circulation instead of immigration, and transnational practices are challenging the classical assimilation process. And I believe those changes are particularly striking at the economic level and that's why I will try to illustrate through the study of the second hand cars exportation business. So just uh, a word about the, um, how this presentation will go. The first question for me is why we can find today so many second hand cars in Brussels? It's something a, a bit surprising. And so I will try to reply to this question in the first part of, the first part of this communication which is a description of the economic activity. Then the second part will try to reply to this next question, who are the people involved in this economic activity? And so the second part of this communication will be a description of the profile of the car importers. But before, just a word uh, about the methodology. So the, the starting point of this research was the following idea it's more important to follow the cars in order to meet the people. So I start um, this research in Brussels, and there is a, a whole area in Brussels today uh, where we can find a lot of these second-hand cars. 
And working there, um, I was able to, to meet the first kind of people involving in the involved in this activity, which are the Lebanese people that really um, possess a lot of those garage and, and places linked to this activity in, uh, in Brussels. But it was very difficult for me to, to meet the, the people coming in Belgium to buy those cars. And those people are mainly um, African entrepreneurs. And well, it was very difficult to, to get in touch uh, with them and, and to have some kind of some level of trust uh, between us. So um, I decided to leave Brussels and to, to, to follow the cars. And those cars lead me in West Africa, in, in Benin, more specifically in Cotonou, where I did a few months of uh, field works. And there in Cotonou, it was far more easy to meet those uh, Beninese uh, entrepreneurs to, to gain some level of trust um, with them, which is very important because I discovered another part of this business activity. And more than this, uh, it's very important because those Beninese entrepreneurs are coming on a regular basis to, to Belgium, and it was possible to meet them back in Brussels, and they opened new doors. Um, there in Brussels, uh, they showed me another part of, of the activity that I wasn't able to, um, to see at first. Okay, so um, very quickly I will uh, describe how this business activity is working. Um, it's very important to understand that the second-hand cars that are sold in Belgium are coming from all over Europe. So if we take a, a map of Belgium, um, we can see that the cars arrive from different European countries. Uh, they just gather in Brussels, and from Brussels they will move to Antwerpen, Antwerpen, which is the main harbour in, in Belgium, and from there they will uh, carry on their journey to Africa. So um, they are going to many different African countries, but uh, I focused here more specifically on West Africa, and if we take a map of um, West Africa, um, we have here the, the Benin, and we can see that those cars arrive in Cotonou. And there is a lot of them ar arriving on a daily basis in Cotonou, but uh, a first fact very surprising for me is that there is only 5% of those cars that remain in Benin. In fact, a lot of those cars will cross the country and go um, um, after crossing the country, they will go to Niger. But again, only 5% of those cars will stay in Niger. And in fact, almost 90% of those cars end up in Nigeria. So um, we can see that there is a, a complex um, network uh, here in West Africa. And m mostly the cars are following this route. Some of the cars also cross directly from Cotonou to Lagos. And more importantly, many of the cars crossing the country from Cotonou to Niger, we cross illegally the, the border during the, their journey. Okay, now we have a, a more, um, a very general idea of how it's working. I will just sum up those information. So the cars are coming from all over Europe. They are gathering in business places like Brussels, but uh, there is other one like Rotterdam or Hamburg in Germany. And today, in West Africa, Cotonou is really playing a role of warehouse. And this role of warehouse has been very well described by two geographers, uh, which, an, which are Ige and Soule, two Beninese uh, geographers, in their book L'État Entrepôt au Benin, which can be translated as Benin, a warehouse state. And they show very well um, how and why uh, Benin, and especially Cotonou Harbour, is playing this role of, of warehouse um, at the level of uh, West Africa today. So just a few data illustrating uh, this. There is um, between 500 and 1,000 cars arriving daily in, uh, in Cotonou. And all those cars are labeled in Transit Niger. So it's, um, it's like this, especially for tax matter. In fact, uh, the interland countries, the, the West African countries that don't have access to, to the seaside have uh, very important preferential taxes for the goods transiting to, to Cotonou. So all those cars will be labeled in transit Niger, even if, I, I just show you, almost 90% of them uh, end up in Nigeria. So um, one last data. 
In 2001, out of the 230,000 cars leaving from Cotonou to Niger, uh, 215,000 crossed the border illegally to, to Nigeria, so this is uh, a very huge uh, amount uh, of them.